identity need to be centered in the experiences of the most marginalized people. Um, we need to prioritize them, we need to advocate for them. Um, the rich white folks have had their share and we quite frankly need a lot more balance. We also need to operate with clear morals. We often hear about issues over presentism, um, applying our contemporary standards of morality to issues in the past. I understand that, but there are elements of our humanity that are timeless and we need to have faith in the basic principles of justice that we as a nation claim to hold dear. Um, what I'm saying is that we should not be afraid to be judged by history in our own moment. Um, as, look, as long as you're not killing, oppressing, hurting, or stealing, uh, then you're probably going to be just fine in our memory. Those basic fundamental principles that hold true. So, I will start with a little story. Um, four years ago, I was at an event at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, for the uh, Center for the Study of the American South. And these events are very white. Southern history is very white. Southern studies have traditionally been very white, despite the prevalence of black people all over the South. Um, that is, of course, because of segregation and Jim Crow. People who look like me and many of you do not have an opportunity to work at places like the University of North Carolina and many other PWI institutions. In any event, I'm there at this gathering, and there's about 100 people there. Besides the people serving food, there was only one other black person there. And during that event, an older white man walked up to me to tell me something. And he told me this, and I'll never forget it, and I quote, I just want to let you know that my family owned slaves, and those slaves were happy. Oh. This is race, memory, and identity all playing out in a single sentence, shared with a stranger at a party. His identity, my perceived identity, his race, my perceived race, and a family memory all in one sentence, right there at that party. Um, I didn't know who the white man was then, but I certainly do now. And I know a lot more about his family than I did then. I know where his family owned slaves. I know how many they owned. Uh, this is in the eastern part of North Carolina toward Wilmington. And of course, because I'm a historian and I want to double check these things, um, you know, I know better than to take the old man at his word, okay? I go and I look at the sources and I read about what black people at the time said. Um, Harriet Jacobs, who was enslaved in the eastern part of North Carolina, said this about the, the period of enslavement. The degradation, the wrongs, the vices that grow out of slavery are more than I can describe. They are greater than you would willingly believe. On my 15th year, a sad epoch in the life of a slave girl, my master began to whisper foul words in my ear. Young as I was, I could not remain ignorant of their import. She also wrote, death is better than slavery. Harry Jacobs, clearly not a happily enslaved person near where that <laughs> man's plantation was, his family's plantation. David Walker said this about slavery near where he grew up, also in eastern North Carolina, near Wilmington, North Carolina. The Americans say that we are ungrateful, but I ask them, for heaven's sake, what should we be grateful to them for? For murdering our mothers and fathers? Or do they wish us to return thanks to them for chaining and handcuffing us, branding us, cramming fire down our throats, or for keeping us in slavery? When explaining his decision to leave Wilmington, Walker explained, if I remain in this bloody land, I will not live long. I cannot remain where I must hear slaves' chains continually and where I must encounter the insults of their hypocritical enslavers. Again, this clearly suggests slavery was not necessarily a happy experience near where that man's family's plantation was. So that particular white man, who also during this conversation told me that when Sherman arrived at his family's plantation, the slave matriarch told Sherman to turn back around because they were quite content. Um, <laughs> Of course, he couldn't possibly know how any of those enslaved people felt. It's just something he tells people, of course. And I'm certain I'm not the first person, certainly not the first black person, that he has told this to. I'm sure it's etched in family lore. It's been passed down through generations. Uh, like so many myths in America's racial history, this lie is rooted in white paternalism. The idea, especially in the South, that white people uplifted the inferior race through their generosity. It's a lie constructed to justify both the past and the present. Um, in the past, it justified disfranchisement, racial inequality, and Jim Crow. Today, it remains a pillar of a particular type of Southern white conservatism, that black people didn't really have it all that bad, and that white people deserve credit for building Southern society because they were more innovative and industrious. And that everything we have was built because of them. He's saying, look, this is all mine, and you are a guest. You are allowed to be here. So follow the logic here. If those enslaved people were happy, then the old man's family did nothing morally wrong. 
And if they did nothing wrong, then slavery was just part of a natural process, not only necessary for the development of the South and of America, but even, in some ways, for my very existence at that particular party and in my current position.